Hello and welcome to Runaway Art, Interpreting Colonial Slave Ads. This is the online version of the professional development presentation given at Phillipsburg Manor in Sleepy Hollow, New York. My name is Michael Lord, and I'm the Associate Director of Content Development and Delivery at Historic Hudson Valley. I am also the author of this presentation. So, why have we developed this program? Well, in short, we did so because of this proverb. Until the lions have their own historians, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Although attributed to the award-winning author and poet, Professor Achebe freely admits that this African proverb long predates his existence on the planet. Now, as a proverb, well, it's pretty universal. Both uh, Winston Churchill and George Orwell have noted that history is written by the victors, while Napoleon is said to have stated that history is simply lies agreed upon. History, then, is really just an accumulation of perspectives. And the more points of view collected, the more thorough our understanding is of the past. We want to get your students to see history this way, that a single primary document shouldn't be taken simply at face value. We want them to question the authority of that document. And the payoff is that students will learn how to examine a primary document, now in this case a runaway ad, flip it over, and read between the lines to see it from another perspective. Runaway Art, Interpreting Colonial Slave Ads is a three-year project funded by the New York Community Trust. Originally piloted as an art contest for students at economically disadvantaged schools in Westchester, Runaway Art has been redesigned to provide a deeper, wider-reaching, and sustainable educational experience for thousands of New York City middle school students. For the 2014-15 school year, Runaway Art engaged with 14 public middle schools throughout New York City, serving more than 2,000 students. We are carrying over nearly all the schools served last year and adding 14 more to reach more than 4,500 students. The program will consist of the following the development of an age-appropriate curriculum within a collaborative classroom instructional model, the provision of professional development workshops for social studies teachers, art teachers, and teaching artists, student creation of two-dimensional art inspired by 18th century runaway slave ads from local newspapers, and a comprehensive online resource containing an exhibition of the student artwork, professional development materials, classroom curricula, a discussion forum for teachers, scanned primary documents, historical vignettes, and other related content. Runaway Art improves the quality of education for students by humanizing a complex and sensitive subject, bringing it into the classroom and allowing students time for personal reflection and for discussion. Now for this program, we want to move away from that grand institutional model of slavery in America, and really focus on our own backyard. That'll be New York City, King and Queens counties, Richmond County, Bronx, Westchester. We'll look at a handful of issues and events and individuals so we can really just personalize this story. Now I'll set the Wayback Machine for New York City, Friday the 29th of May, 1741. New York at this time was still a colonial outpost, third in size behind Boston and Philadelphia. Most of Manhattan, in fact, was covered in forests and fields and streams and ponds. City limits were well south of present-day Canal Street, while both Greenwich and Harlem were two separate towns on the island. We're looking at New York City Hall at the intersection of Wall and Broad Street, where Federal Hall and the statue of George Washington sits today. On the second floor sits the Supreme Court for the province of New York. Daniel Horsemanden, third justice on the Supreme Court is about to pronounce sentence for Quack and Cuffey, two enslaved men belonging to John Roosevelt and Adolph Phillips of the city. The two men were indicted, and I'm going to read the indictment here, for wickedly, voluntarily, feloniously, and maliciously conspiring, combining, and confederating with diverse other Negroes to kill and murder the inhabitants of this city. After a very short trial, they were found guilty as charged. Horse Mandan's sentence reads as follows, That you and each of you be carried from hence to the place from whence you came, and from thence to the place of execution, where you and each of you shall be chained to a stake and burnt to death. And may the Lord have mercy on your poor wretched souls. Now that was just the beginning. Over the next three months, 29 enslaved men would be publicly executed, 13 hanged, and another 16 
burnt alive while chained to a stake. Now, a slave conspiracy? An insurrection here in New York City? <laughs> How did we get to this? Slavery was a Southern thing, right? This is New York. We're urban, urbane, integrated. We're home to the abolitionists, the anti-slavery societies, and the Underground Railroad. You know, we're supposed to be the good guys, right? Well, in the 18th century, New York City and Charleston, South Carolina had the two largest slave populations in the 13 colonies. In fact, by 1740, one New Yorker in five was enslaved, 20% of the population. At this point, not only did all 13 colonies have a legal system of slavery, but every European colony in the New World had legalized slavery, from Canada all the way down to Chile. So, during the 18th century, it was the continent of Africa that accounted for the largest migration of people into the colonies. According to historian David Eltis, between 1700 and 1760, three out of every four people coming into the Americas were coming from Africa. And this was the forced migration via the transatlantic slave trade. So let's go back before the events of 1741 to learn how and why things got that way. The African presence in the New World goes hand in hand with that of Europeans. So in 1492, right, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In 1493, now you're not gonna find a rhyme for that, but the first documented black man comes to the New World. He's not an enslaved man. Pedro Alonso was a crewman on board Columbus's second expedition. In 1525, one year after Giovanni Verrazzano sails into New York Harbor, but not up the river, a free black Portuguese pilot named Esteban Gomez, who had apparently sailed previously for Ferdinand Magellan, sails into the mouth of the Hudson, what Gomez named the Rio de Servos, or the Deer River. Now, Gomez doesn't stick around. He leaves after taking about four dozen natives back to Lisbon. Next century, late spring, 1613, a Dutch explorer sails his ship, the Young Tobias, along the west side of Manhattan. The captain leaves one of his sailors, a man named Jan Rodriguez, described as a black rascal, on the island with enough equipment for him to settle, hunt, and defend himself. Rodriguez deals peacefully with local Native Americans, learns their language, and eventually serves as an interpreter for other Dutch ships entering the harbor. Now, Rodriguez, West Indian-born and of African descent, settles on the island, even marries into the Rockaway Indian clan. The year again? 1613, 11 years before New Netherlands was officially established, seven years before the Mayflower lands at Plymouth, and a full six years before the so-called first Africans arrive at Jamestown. Rodriguez, in fact, was the first non-indigenous inhabitant of Manhattan. So in 1626, about a dozen or so African captives were delivered into the settlement of New Amsterdam. They were captured loot from a Spanish vessel. Now, since the Dutch West India Company had no laws at this point defining enslaved labor, these men were considered indentured servants. Although the length of their indenture was never clearly defined and seems to have been permanent. Slavery then begins as a social custom, an informal practice not yet codified. This was no different than in Jamestown, where the first African arrivals in 1619 were also considered indentured servants because Virginia also had no laws defining slavery. Under Dutch rule in New Netherlands, this unofficial form of slavery has been referred to as a form of half-freedom. Now this term is misleading because it suggests a kinder, gentler form of enslavement in this region compared to other European colonies in the New World. It stems from a 1644 court case where several of those first captives sue the Dutch West India Company for their freedom to end their permanent indenture or informal enslavement. The Dutch West India Company, in fact, awards these men their freedom and freedom for their wives, but for their children, and I'll quote here, both those already in existence and those hereafter born shall be slaves. What kind of freedom is this? If you pick up and move out of the colony, you leave your children behind. If you move within the colony, any future children that you may have will belong to somebody else as their slave. One can't be half free and half slave. It's like being half dead. So during the first half of the 17th century, a time when this area was governed by the Dutch, well, England and France were also in the process of developing a legal definition to the informal custom of owning slaves in their American colonies. 
In the early 1600s, this notion of half-freedom could very well describe the custom of enslavement in Tidewater, Virginia as well. Now, slavery may have been ubiquitous in the colonies, but it was loosely defined. Each colony worked at its own pace in moving from the informal custom of owning permanent indentures towards the legal definition of enslavement as a form of chattel property. After the English took control of New Netherlands in 1664, the nature of enslavement takes shape as a more formalized, legal institution. English slaveholders wanted assurances from the crown that their property rights would remain consistent from colony to colony. So over the next 40 years, slavery in New Jersey, New York, Virginia, New England, and the Carolinas were all brought in line with the Black Codes first established in Barbados in the early 1660s. A legal definition of slavery gradually develops. Slaves are considered chattel or movable property. The status of the child will reflect that of the mother. Questionable paternity, then, would not result in lawsuits for inheritance. Baptism will not alter one's status as a slave. And as far as the law was concerned, by the first decade of the 18th century, slavery in New York was nearly identical to slavery in every English colony from Boston to Barbados. So let's explore this question about the use of slaves as a system of labor. First of all, why slavery, not indentured servitude or wage labor? And second, and maybe more interesting, why Africa? Why did European settlers living in America go to a third continent, Africa, for their source of labor? Now, as a labor system, enslavement's been around a long time. Europeans certainly didn't invent slavery. It goes back to the dawn of civilization, when the first group of people beat up the second group of people. Well, those prisoners of war become your laborers, right? Western civilization has a long history using slave labor. Egyptians and Assyrians were enslaving people more than 5,000 years ago. Two to 3,000 years ago, the Greeks and the Romans, they were enslaving people. In fact, the word slave comes from the Romans' use of forced labor from the Slavic peoples of Eastern Europe, right? Slavic, slave. Byzantium slaves were coming from Turkey and the Balkans. Islamic Moors were enslaving Spanish captives and Russian serfs. Well, it's all over our history here. So how does this apply to the New World colonies? Let's try some conventional wisdom here. Just about every European nation colonizing the New World travels down a similar path in search of a labor system. Step one, you've just landed on a new continent. Where are you going to look for your laborers? Well, you're going to look in your own backyard, right? Why? Because in your own backyard, there are local individuals who live here. Indigenous Native Americans. They are local. They're plentiful. They certainly outnumber you. And you're able to exploit conflict between the various groups and confederations of natives to take POWs as your laborers. Now, let's put this into practice, though, because in the theory, it sounds pretty good. In practice, yes, these individuals are local, but that also means they know the land better than you, and it's easy for them to run off. And second, more importantly, using Native Americans as your forced laborers oftentimes will anger the Native leaders. And it's not really a good idea to practice forced labor with your business partners. The Iroquois, the Algonquians, they're very well organized and very powerful confederacies. Upsetting them meant that they could take their lumber and beaver pelts that you need, possibly north to somebody else, say to the French in Canada, and trade with them. And also, angering local natives left one open to attack. Early colonial forts built by Europeans were protected by cannons, but those cannons were pointed toward the sea or the river to defend against other Europeans. Native Americans burnt and destroyed farms and forts by basically coming through the back door. This happened at Pavonia, a small settlement on the New Jersey side of the Hudson in 1643 when local Wappinger Indians attacked. And third and most important, disease. Contact kills. Prolonged close contact between Europeans and Native Americans resulted in the transmission of diseases to which the natives had no resistance. And in a very short while, there simply weren't enough natives in the area to use as laborers. So if using people in one's own backyard proved ineffective, then where are you going to look next? Well, how about looking in your hometown? Indentured servitude was the next phase in supplying unskilled labor to the new world. Now, on paper, 
Indentured servitude sounds like a really good plan, a situation where everybody wins or, or gets something for their efforts. Think about the working classes in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, first of all, there are a lot of them. There hasn't been a major pandemic like the Black Plague for centuries, and peasants keep on making more peasants. So in theory here, there are plenty of peasants in Europe. How are we going to move them to places where the labor is needed? In fact, why sail 3,000 miles across the Atlantic for work? Well, first of all, there's little opportunity for upward mobility in the class-based hierarchy of Europe. Peasants are going to remain peasants. They're going to remain landless. Indentured servitude in the New World offers them a short-term labor contract, five, six, or seven years. And what do they get as promise of payment for doing that work? They get land. The one thing they can't get in Europe, land represents upward mobility. And it's only possible in America where there is land to be had. So a marketing campaign kind of goes up. Come to America, work five, six, seven years. We'll even pay for your voyage. We'll give you food, clothing, and shelter. And after you fulfill that work contract, we'll give you the one thing you can never get back home. We're going to give you land, 50 acres of it. Does that make it worth the trip? Well, apparently so, because indentured servitude begins to work here. But we're going to put that into practice, and it makes things a little different. The work here in the New World is exhaustive. Landlords are working their temporary labor hard. Five, six, or seven years on their contract? Well, they're going to spend that time clearing forests, tilling new fields, draining swamps, building settlements. And the life expectancy for an indentured servant at that time just happens to be five, six, or seven years. So often, you're dead before you actually receive any land. And the English gentry aren't too upset about that because they're not eager to give away land to their former indentures. What they're going to do if they do that, they're making those indentures basically their competitors. So it turns out this isn't the land of milk and honey. The streets aren't paved in gold. And those peasants wisely stop wanting to come. So what do Europeans do? They open up their doors to debtor prisons and vagrants for a labor source. They bring them to the New World, and these men, well, they're not highly motivated to work. They just got to get out of jail free card. And the system, it falls apart. It turns out that temporary labor is just not the answer. A permanent source of labor was necessary, and that meant looking elsewhere. And where was elsewhere at that time? Elsewhere meant Africa. Now, why Africa? Well, Africa's a known source. There's been contact between Africa and Europe since the days of Egypt, thousands of years ago. There's been trade going on from West Africa since the Middle Ages, with the Moorish conquest of Spain and the established Trans-Saharan trade routes. West African coast was also familiar to Europeans, at least since the 15th century with the explorers like Vasco da Gama. It turns out that there are seasonal trade winds that blow from Africa to the Americas across the Atlantic and reverse. So transportation isn't an issue. Africans also have resistance to certain European diseases after years of contact. Turns out also that Africans, because they don't live in the Americas, don't know the land. They've been removed from their powerful regimes. They can't blend in. So this permanent source of labor from Africa made sense to the English and the Dutch, just as it did to the Spanish and the Portuguese at least a century earlier. So who were these African captives enslaved in New York? What do we know about, say, Cuffey, the enslaved man who was burned at the stake for his part in the 1741 insurrection conspiracy? Well, we know that Cuffey was owned by Adolph Phillips, one of the wealthiest men in New York. Phillips was a successful merchant, a ship owner, a land owner, slave owner, slave trader, and a long-standing member of the New York Assembly. Cuffey lived at Phillips's home in Lower Manhattan, somewhere near the present-day Francis Tavern. The court transcripts noted that Cuffey read while he was in jail. Now, education was never illegal in New York and wouldn't be legally prohibited in the United States for at least another 90 years. We know that Cuffey visited with his father, but we don't know this man's name, where he lived, or who owned him. We also don't know if Cuffey had more family than his father, siblings, or a spouse, or children. But Cuffey's name, however, tells us that he, or more likely his father, was African-born, and specifically was a part of the Akan culture. 
Now, today the Akan region centers in and around the area of Ghana and includes the Asante and the Coromantine. Kofi is an anglicized version of the name Kofi, a popular day name used by the Akan. Kofi's name tells me that he was born on a Friday. Kofi's co-defendant in the trial, Quack, was also a Khan, as Quaco was the day name for one born on a Wednesday. This region of West Africa was one of the most popular embarkation points in the transatlantic slave trade. The Phillips' transatlantic trade routes also included Central Africa, as they were often sailing south farther along the continent for their captives. In 1685, the Phillips-owned ship, the Charles, sailed from New York Harbor to Great Britain. After unloading sundry goods, she took on fresh water and, with a crew of 16, set sail for the coast of West Africa. Now, English vessels looking to purchase African slaves along the coast had several locations to do so. The gold and slave coasts stretched from the English fort at Cape Coast to Witta and into the Bight of Benin. But the Charles sailed farther south along the coast to Soyo, which is in modern-day Angola, at the mouth of the Congo River. Now, while at Soyo, Captain Codringham purchased 146 Africans. The purchase of these 146 men and women meant trading with a very powerful Bakongo king, and the trade goods included brass, copper, textiles, glassware, and also muskets and gunpowder. The men and women loaded on board the Charles were probably members of the Bakongo people, as the empire at that time was in the midst of a civil war. And often, the losing side would be captured as POWs and then sold as slaves by the winning side. At least two-thirds of the men taken on board the Charles were men. That would be about a hundred people. The men were stripped, shackled at the wrists and feet, and taken below deck to the cargo hold. Now, the Charles was a pink. It's a type of an ocean-going vessel no more than a hundred feet long. Below deck are crew quarters and storage. The storage spaces may be a couple of rooms, 15 feet wide by 20 foot long at the most. One of those rooms would store fresh water and food. The other room was for human cargo. Now think of a living room or a family room about 15 feet by 20 feet. Now picture a hundred people in that space. The men were laid down on their backs along the walls of the hold. Then the middle space was filled up. If there's not enough room, a half deck would have been built midway between the floor and the ceiling, about two and a half feet high or so, and that half deck would have been filled. Maybe the cargo hold could fit a hundred people in this configuration. If not, the English and the Dutch would practice something called tight packing, where these shackled men, rather than being laid down on their backs, would have been turned on their right side or their left side and laid down sort of spoon fashion. For the women... Well, in general, they were allowed to remain above deck, where they cooked, they cleaned, and they were used at the discretion of an all-male crew. At that point, the ship would set sail across the Atlantic. Conditions, as you could imagine, were horrific. The men were held for days, sometimes weeks below deck in equatorial heat, with no circulating air and no facilities. In good weather, and when not in sight of land, They would have been led above deck in small groups of six to eight to stretch atrophied muscles and to have that cargo area cleaned. The crew often grew fearful of insurrection and contagious diseases. How long was this voyage? Well, if you look at this chart, departing from West Central Africa in the year 1685 meant that the voyage on average would last 82 days. That's almost 12 weeks. 105 of the 146 African captives survived this journey across the ocean to dock at Barbados. Of those 105 men and women, 82 were unloaded and delivered to sugar planters in Barbados who would probably purchase them sight unseen months earlier. The remaining 23 survivors, well, they were considered refuse Negroes, men and women too sick or too weak to be of any value on these sugar plantations. These 23 men and women then sailed for New York, and along that journey, another 14 died along the way. So of the 146 captives purchased at Mapinda Soyo, 55 people died on this journey, a loss of almost 38% of the human cargo on board the Charles. Near the town of Rye, those nine survivors disembarked. Of those nine, A young boy with one eye was sent to Manhattan, 
while the remaining eight were taken by Adolf Phillips to the new Upper Mills quarters at Phillipsburg to aid in the construction of the mill, the dam, the manor house, barn, and the Dutch Reformed Church. In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, provisioning plantations like Phillipsburg Manor became profitable enterprises for New York merchants interested in diversifying their trade. Merchants like the Phillipses bought large tracts of land to ensure that their cargo vessels were full on every leg of their transatlantic journeys. These men shipped lumber and beaver pelts to London and Amsterdam in exchange for manufactured products, ceramics, farm tools, spices, textiles, that they then sold within the colony. And by the late 1680s, realizing that there was profit to be made by trading food provisions to the sugar islands in the West Indies, these New York merchants began shipping wheat flour and sea biscuits to feed slave populations in Barbados and Curacao in exchange for sugar and molasses. Like the southern colonies, slavery along the Hudson consisted of skilled, domestic, and field laborers. Enslaved individuals held highly skilled positions at Phillipsburg Manor, uh, like Phillipsburg's miller, Caesar. Now, milling requires a 14-year apprenticeship, on-the-job training, to learn the trade. Caesar would have had a pretty good education. He had to be literate, probably knew a couple of languages, and certainly needed advanced math and engineering skills to understand gear ratios and production output required for the operation of the mill. So what did it mean to be enslaved in New York? It meant being considered property rather than person. And what exactly does that mean? Because frankly, it's a pretty abstract notion. We're all people, regardless of labels, free or slave, right? Well, in theory, yes. But when the law defines you as property, it makes all the difference in the world. In January 1750, Adolph Phillips died at the age of 85. Upon his death, a probate inventory was listed, listing all of his possessions. Page 1 lists Adolf Phillips' most valuable possessions. And this is where we find the names of the 23 men, women, and children enslaved at Phillipsburg Manor. Underneath their names come Phillips' cattle, horses, sheep, pigs, silverware, linens, and furniture. What does it mean to be legally defined as property? Well, let's break it down here. Can property own property? Well, owners may allow slaves to earn tips or money from Sunday work to buy clothing or cookware, but these are customary practices and carry no legal authority. No slave could own real estate, which was really the only true measure of wealth at that time. Can property marry? Marriages were not legal or binding within the enslaved community. Owners demanded the right to do with their property as they saw fit and a marriage would prohibit the owner from separating husband from wife. Do the children of slaves belong to the parents or the owners? Well, we've established this. The child belongs to the owner of the mother. Families were separated. When a slave owner dies, his or her property is either sold to pay debts or divided amongst their heirs. The Sylvesters, the Beekmans, Morrises, Phillipses, Delanceys, Van Cortland families, they all bequeathed slaves to their children in their wills. Immediately after Adolf Phillips' death, his nephew, Frederick Phillips II, inherits his uncle's property, including the 23 enslaved men, women, and children who lived and worked at the Upper Mills quarters. Now, Frederick Phillips had little interest in the Upper Mills site, and in April puts the entire property up for a public vendue, or auction, just three months after his uncle's death. One person sold that day was Sam. Abraham de Peister, a merchant in New York City, purchases Sam for 62 pounds. Who's Sam? Let's take a look at Phillips' inventory. Because marriages did not legally exist for enslaved persons, inventories listed their human property, often by gender, occupation, or age. Looking at this inventory, we have Caesar, Diamond, Samson, Tom, Charles, and children with the same names. These naming patterns suggest a familial relationship. Sam's name could match that of Samson, suggesting a father-son relationship. Sam's young age, eight, also suggests that he was probably born at Phillipsburg, so perhaps then there's a mother and father on this property. Sam's siblings? Well, we don't know. Now look at it this way. Sam was an eight-year-old boy 
sold at an auction for 62 pounds. Be Sam's dad for a moment, or his mom, and imagine watching your son sold away from you. By June, just six months after the death of Mr. Phillips, nine of the 23 men, women, and children at Phillipsburg Manor had been sold off to six different owners, ripping this community apart. To be enslaved, to be property rather than person, means that you have to wake up every day of your life not knowing if you will ever see your family before going to bed that night. There is a profound and unyielding sense of insecurity, of instability, and an inability to either feel protected by your family as a child or to provide security and protection for loved ones as an adult. That's what it means to be declared property rather than person in the eyes of the law. So how did enslaved individuals cope with that level of dysfunction and stress at the core of their existence? Well, they resisted. They resisted actively, passively, covertly, overtly, individually, in groups, alone, or with their families. They endured, they negotiated, and they developed survival skills and coping mechanisms. Let's return now to the events of 1741 to talk about one form of resistance, active resistance. The winter of 1741 was exceptionally hard. The weather was particularly cold and snowy, and by March, residents were experiencing shortages in both food and fuel. Everyone was looking forward to the spring and the thaw that would inevitably arrive. At about 1 p.m. on Wednesday the 18th of March, Fort George, the governor's headquarters, began to burn. Before landfill in large lower Manhattan, Fort George was located at the southernmost tip of the island. Today it's the site of the old customs house. Fire was always cause for alarm. London's Great Fire of 1666 burned over 13,000 buildings, and Boston was nearly destroyed by fire in 1711. Keep in mind, New York was a city made of wood. Bucket brigades and even the town's fire engine, this ungainly contraption requiring several men to operate, did little to stop the fire burning inside the fort. By the next morning, the residence of Lieutenant Governor George Clark the fort's chapel, and several other buildings within the fort's walls were reduced to ashes. Luckily, it was a light freezing drizzle that began to fall that night, so sparks from the fire did not carry to the rooftops outside the fort and burn the entire town. Nobody suspected arson. Fires were almost always accidental, due to dirty chimneys or errant sparks. The following Wednesday, March the 25th, this was New Year's Day from the old calendar, Another midday fire breaks out at the house of Captain Robert Warren near the Long Bridge. A bucket brigade saves this house from being destroyed. A week later, the 1st of April, fire destroys the warehouse of Wynnant Van Zant. Three fires on three successive Wednesdays, and people are beginning to get suspicious. Then the real trouble begins. Saturday the 4th of April, fire at the cow stables of Jacobus Quick near the Fly Market on the corner of Maiden Lane and Pearl Street. A few hours later, fire at the house of Ben Thomas on the west side of town. And early the next morning, coals were discovered under a haystack in the stables of the city clerk, a man named Joseph Murray. A string of ashes and coals were traced from those stables to a nearby outbuilding where one of Murray's slaves lived. The next day, Monday the 6th of April, four more fires. One was at the house of Sergeant George Burns near the fort and others started at Mrs. Hilton's house near the fly market, again at Pearl and Maiden Lane. This one was clearly set, as pieces of burnt tow were recovered under the roof shingles where the fire had begun. Then another fire is reported at Frederick Phillips's warehouse on New Street, and while the Phillips fire was being tended, another fire breaks out. One of the few townspeople who remained at Phillips's warehouse saw Phillips's slave, Cuffy, leap out of the smoldering warehouse, hop over several garden fences. Authorities then arrested Cuffey shortly thereafter at the home of his owner, Adolph Phillips. Nine fires in 18 days, and the town needed answers. Enter Mary Burton, a 16-year-old Irish immigrant and indentured servant working for a tavern keeper named John Hewson. Burton gave the authorities what they were looking for, names, dates, conversations, 
and a story more frightening than even arson, a story of insurrection. Burton stated that Phillips's Cuffy was often at Houston's tavern, along with two other enslaved men, Caesar and Prince. Mary Burton's testimony noted that she was forced to wait on these three enslaved men as they drank at Houston's tavern. But Burton said more. She said there were secret meetings being held at the tavern. Slaves from all over town would meet there late at night. They would eat and drink, and one by one, Hewson, along with Caesar, Prince, and Cuffy, would lead them upstairs where each would swear an oath. An oath to set fire to the town and kill whites as they came to extinguish the flames. Burton's deposition played into some of the deepest fears of a slaveholding society. Insurrections were big news stories that regularly made it into the front pages of New York's newspapers. 1739, Charleston, South Carolina had its Stono Rebellion, where slaves from several plantations along the Stono River killed scores of white owners in an attempt to march to Spanish Florida, where the Spanish government, at war with England at the time, promised freedom to slaves from the English colonies. 1736, Antigua. Large-scale conspiracy to insurrect was discovered and resulted in the execution of dozens of slaves accused of the conspiracy, although no actual insurrection ever took place. 1733 in St. John's, slaves insurrected and actually held the island for nearly six months. And the ongoing Maroon Wars in Jamaica throughout the 1720s and 30s, not only were white New Yorkers aware of all of this, many in the enslaved community could read and did read these accounts. Other enslaved individuals were brought into New York from the very locations experiencing these revolts. And then there was New York's own insurrection in 1712. The elders in 1741 experienced this firsthand. In the spring of 1712, a small group of African-born slaves, almost all of them like Cuffy and Quack, a Khan or Coromantine, conspired to set fire to the town and kill whites as they came to put out the flames. Nine whites were killed in this attempt. The Africans who started this insurrection expected other slaves in the city to join in, but they didn't. The Africans were caught and executed horrifically for their acts. Some were hanged, others were burned alive at the stake, one was broken at the wheel, another dragged through town until dead, and one was slowly turned on a spit and cooked over a flame for eight hours. Their torture was meant as a warning to any slaves who would ever think about insurrecting in New York City. That warning was heeded for 29 years, but in 1741, townsfolk were again in a panic. Hundreds of slaves were detained, held for weeks in overcrowded prisons and questioned. Mary Burton named names. Other slaves cooperated with the authorities, naming names with hopes of being pardoned or freed. Now, the result was a form of mass hysteria that some compared to the Salem witch trials that occurred some 50 years earlier. More than 140 enslaved men were found guilty of conspiracy. Some were pardoned for naming names, but 70 were deported to the sugar islands of Barbados and Jamaica, and another 30 were executed. But the insurrection never occurred. Fires may have been deliberately set, and slaves may have indeed discussed insurrection. But unlike the 1712 insurrection, not one white person was murdered or attacked as they came to put out the flames. Resistance to enslavement in the form of an organized insurrection was futile and violently suppressed. As we see from the 1741 plot, even conspiracy to insurrect was punishable by death. An enslaved person didn't need to actively resist to raise a hand against a white person to be executed. They could be executed just for talking about insurrection. But there were other forms of resistance, forms that weren't so overt as to get you killed for just talking about it. These were the survival skills, the common sense methods of getting out of doing work that were both subtle and effective. And we continue to practice these forms today. How do we get out of doing something that we don't want to do without saying no? What are some of the methods? Well, one can work slow, pace yourself. You don't get into trouble this way. You use rhythm to pace yourself in the fields. You break tools, you lose tools. A very effective way of pacing oneself. Other ways, one can feign illness. We still practice this. Mental health days that we could take off. 
And probably the best or most effective way of getting out of doing a job that you don't want to do is to basically act incompetent. Act like you don't have the responsibility, the wherewithal to perform that task. Now, acting is the key word here. Because you've got to get over on the owner or the overseer who is writing all of this down in their daily logs and journals. So what he writes down is what he thinks he sees. Slaves are all lazy, uh, shiftless, too sick, too incompetent to do any good work here. Now, if that's what gets written down, that's what historians are going to pick up and read years later. And that's the side of history that we're going to get in our history books. The negative stereotypes about lazy, shiftless, good-for-nothing slaves. We get that side of the story because the other side of the story isn't being written down. Now, of course, slaves could read. They could write. But what slave is going to put down on paper the secrets of getting out of doing their work? Makes no sense. Those survival skills were meant to be covert, to be secretive. So they were passed down orally from one generation to the next. What we're trying to do is turn that around and put a perspective on the past, telling both sides of the story. The tales of the hunt, yes, they are always written by the hunter. But now is the time for the lion side of the story to be told. Now, students visiting Phillipsburg Manor often express anger at the system of enslavement and suggest that they would have resisted slavery through acts of sabotage, through open rebellion, and physical violence against their slave owners. Now, it's not just students who would want to fight back. How many of us feel that we could be pushed to a point where we would fight violence with violence? Doesn't this make you wonder why more slaves didn't fight back? The slave population at Phillipsburg Manor outnumbered the overseer 23 to 1, but there is no written evidence of active resistance taking place at Phillipsburg. What kept them from fighting back? Or from just leaving? Were they all happy or, or stupid or were they cowards? Oh. First of all, let's think about this. What have you got to lose in raising your hand against your owner? Well, yes, your life. But what kind of life do you have when you're enslaved? You have no property to protect, no chance of attaining the American dream of wealth and success. So why not fight back? Aren't you willing to die for a cause? Maybe. But slave owners knew this too. So the consequences of their actions would have an effect on others. And what does that mean? Well, it means if you act up, your family will suffer. Perhaps your spouse or your child gets whipped for your transgression while you're forced to watch that. You do it again, and you'll be separated from them, permanently. This is one of the reasons why slaveholders kept families together. Not because they're wonderfully nice people, but they needed to maintain control of the community. Students visiting Phillipsburg Manor learned quickly that enslaved persons weren't weaker or dumber or more cowardly than we are today. They were just behaving responsibly, as I think most of us would, in terms of keeping their families from being punished for their actions. Now, a word or two now about fairness, because I think this concept is important to students. Slavery wasn't fair. Slave owners, well, they played by the rules, but it was their rules. They obeyed the law, but the law itself wasn't fair. And that's a big deal for students, because up until the middle school years, children are taught and exposed to a rather simplistic notion of human behavior. There are good guys and there are bad guys. There are heroes, there are villains. Things are either right or they're wrong. If you play hide and seek, well, you better close your eyes and count to ten, slowly. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, because that's the rules. You're either a Jedi or a Sith, a plant or a zombie. But slavery doesn't play by those rules because it simply wasn't fair. The law says that slavery is okay. And the law represents the rules, right? So, are the rules wrong? Well, yes, sometimes rules are wrong. And that's something new for students to grasp. The founding fathers, right, the good guys who won our independence, they were also slaveholders. Runaway art messes with the student's concept of fair play, and we have to be careful not to turn students into cynics at such a young and impressionable age. One commonly practiced form of resistance was the act of stealing yourself, of robbing your owner of your labor, also known as running away. Now, some individuals ran to find freedom, 
But during the colonial era, freedom rarely meant running north. There simply was no north to run to as far as freedom was concerned. All colonies had some form of slavery at this point. So freedom often meant running to a city where one could blend in with the large black population or find employment as a sailor. Others ran to find family, friends, or acquaintances, while some even ran as a family. In New York, runaway advertisements provide us with a wealth of knowledge about enslaved individuals and their community. These ads show evidence of ongoing resistance practiced by individuals against the institution of slavery, and they allow students a glimpse into the appearance, the skills, cultures, education, personalities, and motives of those who chose to run. Runaway Art, interpreting colonial slave ads, asks students to reconstruct a runaway ad from the perspective of the subject, the enslaved individual or individuals described in the ad. After creating their art, students then must write an accompanying statement describing their work and how that project made them feel about enslavement. So we have art, social studies, self-expression, and self-identity. The program touches on all of this. The pilot program, as you can see here from these examples, suggests that in the process of creating their artwork, students developed an understanding of and an empathy for the enslaved individuals described in the advertisements. Using art as a medium to tell the story of enslavement in their own backyard focuses the students' attention. Now, their technical proficiency isn't really the point here. Rather, it's in their ability to connect on a personal and emotional level with the subject and then be able to explain that connection through their art. Runaway art gives students an opportunity to uh, sort of literally put a face on the past. Now, if in that process, students learn something about the power of art, how it can express ideas and emotions, well, that's terrific. They'll better appreciate the story quilt collage style of Romare Bearden, the relentless angularity and color choices of Jacob Lawrence, and the sense of foreshadowing and loss of Jerry Pinckney's art. Here we have several examples of what 7th grade students can accomplish in this program. From Brooklyn, a complete project consisting of art, personal statement, and the ad. The student depicts Charles as strong on horseback to show him as a person on the move. Now here's a personal statement built right into the art. The statement from the runaway's point of view, Ben. Now, we were able to visit Charles Dewey Middle School in Sunset Park, and we were very impressed with the exhibition that they put on of all of their students' artworks. Here's an artwork that's all about identity. The artist identified with Tamer, one of the four children who ran away with Bell and Lewis in 1748. Probably an example of an entire family running away together. She drew Tamer as older, and possibly even as a role model as she's dressed in business attire. And she also identifies with Tamer's inability to maintain family, noting that, I'll quote here, not knowing where you belong must really suck. Blunt? Well, yes, it's blunt. But she isn't getting this experience sugarcoated, not in this project, so I think it should be blunt. And wrapping up here, did enslavement in New York end with the Declaration of Independence? Right, that document clearly stated that all men were created equal. Did it end with the adoption of the Constitution? That document magically managed never to mention the word slave, yet allowed human property to be counted as three-fifths of a person to determine congressional representation. No, enslavement in New York remained status quo until the end of the century. Gradual emancipation in New York began on July 4, 1799. All newborns born on that date or after would be born free, but they were subject to an indentureship of 25 to 27 years. Complete emancipation came to New York on July 4, 1827 a full 51 years after New York representatives to the Continental Congress signed that declaration stating all men are created equal. So enslavement began in this region when the Dutch West India Company brought those first forced African laborers here around 1626. It ends in 1827. So slavery existed in New York for 201 years. How long has freedom been around? I'll do the math. 188 years in New York. Here's the point. Slavery has existed here in New York longer than freedom has existed. <laughs>
As students grapple with understanding what it meant to be considered property rather than person, an object rather than an individual, and the serious repercussions facing them and their families if they resisted, they begin to see enslavement from a new perspective. It moves from an impersonal, institutional level to something much more personal and relevant. Getting them to communicate this through personal expression, through art, allows them to establish a meaningful connection with the past and allows for the lion's side of the story to finally be heard. I hope that this program will enable students to both hear and present history from the lion's perspective rather than from that of the hunter. This now concludes the online presentation of Understanding Enslavement and Resistance in Colonial New York for Runaway Art, Interpreting Colonial Slave Ads. Thank you.